So, okay, so I, let's try to, uh, I'm going to try to reboot you a little bit, right? To reboot the system. So, um, if I have a gamma hyperbolic group, so I just uh, say that because, but secretly, and I'm only interested in gamma being a surface group, right? So, essentially every hyperbolic group is a surface group, right, so to say. So, um, so then you have this uh, U of gamma, which is this Gromov geometric flow. Maybe I should put a big G. So it's uh, equipped with this uh, flow acting on that. And essentially, U of gamma is equal to L divided by gamma, so where L is a principal R bundle over this space of distinct points in the boundary at infinity. And here this object is compact. And again, since uh, secretly I'm only interested in sur surface group, we have a nice pro prototype of a geodesic flow. So I should say it's a Gromov geodesic flow in the sense that on geodesic flows, there's many of them, right? So a, an example of a geodesic flow is, in this context, you have U of gamma, which is U of S. So what is S is a hyperbolic surface. And here, this is a this is the unitary bundle. Of S, which is a nice manifold. And then I have here acting phi t is just the usual geodesic flow. And what is this picture? So in this context, what is L? L is the unitary tangent bundle of H2. And you know that indeed it fibers over pairs of distant points in the boundary at infinity of H2. And this is identified with the boundary at infinity of gamma. Okay? So now what is the nanos of representation in that context? So if rho is the representation of gamma into SL of E, so that we call that this defines a vector bundle E rho over U of gamma, which is associated, so it's called associated bundles. This is a fairly general construction. This bundle is flat. In a sense, it's flat as a local system. And this bundle is equipped with a lift of the geodesic flow. And this lift is something which I can describe as a parallel transport, transport a long orbit. So, how do you describe uh, lift? I, I want to call it phi t. So then, what is this uh, phi t? Uh, what is given? What is this phi t action? So actually, if you, so uh, if so on. So remember, you have u of gamma, you have e rho here, and you have a universal. I mean, you have this uh, bundle, this uh, L over U of gamma, and then here, the subject lift to the product of L cross E, and here, the action of phi is the trivial action along the fiber. Along the fiber. 
So it looks like pretty stupid because this action doesn't do anything. It's not an action at all. It doesn't move anything. Okay? But we'll explain that that it does move something in some way. Okay, so maybe, and uh, right, and then the uh, 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 definition, so rho is anosov. Maybe I could ask, uh, I could say, with respect to some parabolic, anosov, if e rho admits a dominatic splitting, E rho is equal to E1 rho plus E k rho. And of course, the various decomposition that you allow, which is given by the different ranks of the object, is exactly what describes the parabolic. Okay? So maybe I should now give examples. So here is my, the plan of this talk for today. So I want to give some examples. And actually explain what are each in representations. So somehow this definition is, as Misha said, it's I mean it was it's an obvious, really an obvious say, an obvious concept for anyone who has been looking at, I don't know, Margulis super rigidity or any kind of this stuff. So so the point is that uh, the, why did it, did it crystallize as a, as a definition? Because, because of this example. So then I'm going to talk about limit maps. And I'm going to explain that. So for instance, for projective Anosov representation, Anosov, for if the projective Anosov, then you can produce out of that a map Xi from the boundary at infinity of gamma to the uh, projective space of P, which is actually Hulder. So it's going to make, to, make a, to make sense, to make a relation with uh, what uh, Misha was talking about. And then, finally, um, I'm going to explain that actually a representation a Nanosov representation, let's say, I'm going just to say, to talk about projective Nanosov representation. Is um, the same thing as a uh, geodesic flow for uh, gamma, and in particular, it has a length spectrum and entropy on other objects. So this part is a, a well. This part is a job. Is something which uh, we have been thinking a lot with uh, Martin Bridgman, uh, Di Canari, and uh, Andres Sambarino. Okay, so let's start with the example. So what is the mother of all example? The mother of all example is a function representation. So you take gamma into SL2R. So here gamma is a surface group, right? And which is a monodromy of a hyperbolic representation of a hyperbolic structure. Okay, so what, uh, what, what is it that you do now? So you have U of H2. If I take a vector U in, in U of H2, then you have two. So that's going to be Xi of U, and that's going to be Xi star of U. So associate of U to U, to, so for, from U in H2, you can consider the geodesic passing through, through this guy, and there is two points at infinity, and you obtain Xi of U <coughs> at 
the bounded infinity of H2 and xi star of u at the boundary at infinity in the boundary of infinity of H2. And this actually is identified with our P1. So what is this uh, with P of... Uh, so let's say I want to call this as SL of E, where dimension of E is equal to 2. Right? So this is going to be the projective space of E, and this is going to be the also the projective space of E. Right, so this implies that, so from this consideration, you see that E cross U of H2 over H2 splits as uh, xi of u plus xi star of u as a bundle. Because each, for each point, so what is xi of u as a bundle? For each point in u, I describe a line in u, so I really have this splitting. So what do you, can you say about this splitting? So first, the splitting is SL is, is SL of E invariant. Meaning that this is a three group of H of H2. And if you make this act here by the diagonal action here. So then this splitting is invariant. Uh, equiv I'm sorry, equivariant, equivariant, equivariant. Okay. And the second thing is that uh, the splitting is constant along the geodes along geodesics because it's only dependent on the endpoints. So in other words, it means that it is, so that's exactly to say that it is phi invariant. So this starts good. I have a splitting. The splitting is equivariant. And, uh, and this splitting is a phi invariant. So now I claim that the splitting is dominating. It's kind of very weird if you think of it, because the splitting is just constant, essentially in some way, along a geodesic. So how could it be, how could it be, uh, how could it be dominating? The point is that to define the domination, you need a metric. It's independent of the metric when you are in a compact space, but now it is not invariant on the metric if you're in a non-compact space. So when I say it is constant, in respect to some constant metric, but the natural metric on this E is not constant. So I have to, 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 uh, to explain that. So from point one, you see that so from point one, one on two, this means that you obtain a phi invariant splitting of E rho over u of gamma. Okay? Because this is invariant of the group, in particular it's invariant under the, it's equivalent under the discrete group, so you obtain the splitting here. So now I want to say that the splitting is invariant. So what truly happens? In this context, you have an interpretation of a point in there. So this, this vector is, a, so, so now what about splitting? What about dominating? So what about dominating? Okay, so a point, uh, so u in, H, in u of h2, so this defines a point x in h2, which is just a projection of h2, and the point in h2 is just a metric on E, right? So H2 
is a symmetric space for SLE, so it's a space of metrics of R2, on R2, uh, on E, uh, metric with the same um, determinant. How do you say that? Well, okay, let's say zero. Say so you the same determinant. Uh, so let's see how this, how this means. So a, this means that uh, right. So, uh, and of course, this metric, a metric on E. So this defines a vector. Let's say a U on uh, not U uh, um, V in psi of U of norm one, and of course a vector W in psi of U of norm one. So let's try to make a drawing. So I have my geodesic here. So I have my point here. I have my R2, and it splits into two objects, which is Xi of U and Xi star of U. And as this vector So I have this vector u, which is v, which is here. And I have this vector w, which is here. So now what happens when I move the geodesic flow along the geodesic flow? So the splitting is constant, but the metric is not constant. And it's exactly transformed by the, by the diagonal matrices, so the new Vector is going to be Vt, and this is going to be, so there's going to be Wt, and this is going to be Vt. And the point is that Vt is going to be exponential t of V, and Wt is equal to exponential minus t of V. So to be fairly honest, there's many, of, many ways under which this could be wrong. So there could be, the minus could be here, and the plus could be here, and there could be a one half, or there could be a two. But essentially, you have to think of this as a, you are exponentially contracting in one way and exponentially dilating in that way. Okay? So this means that the norm of phi t of v this means that the norm, so what happens about the norm what is the norm of Vt now? So this has a, so norm of Vt is one, so this means that the norm, um, right, so norm of Vt is one, but this is equal to, so it's, it's going to be at the point phi t of u, so it's going to be exponential t times the norm of of, uh, of uh, v at phi t of u, but v is actually phi t of v, right? Because my, my, the action of my phi t is just, is just you identify all the vector, the parallel transport. So this implies that, uh, and this is one, so this implies that the norm of phi t of v is equal to e minus t, and it converges to, uh, it's equal to E minus T. And on the other end, the norm of phi T of w, w is going to be equal to E to the T. So that's exactly the dominating. So that is the dominating condition. So let's repeat again the construction. You have this family along the geodesic, so you have this plane. 
each point is a metric, and now you have to understand how does this family of metric evolves. So then I, here you have to do the exercise by yourself. So it exactly evolves in the following way. Well, exactly more, more or less plus or minus one, one, two. There's no pi. That's the only thing I'm sure about. So the, the guise of norm one now is going to be exactly uh, e to the minus tw, and the guy of norm one is going to be e to the tv. But if you interpret that, so this guy is of norm one, and this means that the norm, so v is actually parallel transport of, of, uh, of, uh, of v itself at time t, because the guy is uh, acting constantly on the fibers. So that's your dominating condition. Right, so you have to sit down and do the exercise by yourself to get convinced about that. Okay, so that's the first example of what is a, a what is a what is an analysis of representation. It's just a hyperbolic uh, representation. And this is the first step for. So if you believe that analysis of representation is a nice, is a correct way to have a to be linear for hyperbolic group. And of course, surface group has to pass, uh, high, uh, function group has to pass this test, right? So actually, I have a question. That's a question for Misha or anybody else. If you have a hyperbolic group which is linear, do you have hyperbolic groups which are linear which would not admit another of representation? It's unknown, right? OK, so now let's move to teaching representation. So first, let's say uh, uh, okay. So I have to de define first to recall it. What is the little bit of algebra? Which what is the irreducible representation of SL2R in SLNR? So it's just one representation of dimension n of SL2R. So how do you produce it? So uh, so let uh, PK, which is a space of homogeneous polynomials of in two variables. Of degree k. Okay, so so what is p one? P one is generated by x. Is generated by x on y, right? These are just monomials. So this is of dimension two. So what is p two? This is generated by x two x, y, y2. So this is dimension 3. And uh, so that's enough for an induction. And the dimension of pk is equal to k plus 1. Right? And now there is a natural representation of SL2R on that. So let A be a matrix. Let A be a matrix, an element in SL2R. So, a, so what is the action? So let P of XY, uh, which belongs to, uh, to PK, um, so then, let A P of X Y to be equal 
to uh, P of uh, uh, X composed with A, Y composed with B. So what does this, uh, B, there's no B. So what does this mean? I see X, X as an element of E star. Okay, so monomial is element in E star, right? So again, there is a good chance there is a minus one here to have a correct uh, representation, right? A left representation. So, uh, so what does it mean in particular? This mean that, uh, so this means that uh, if A is equal to A, B, C, D, so what is A, P of X, Y? This is just uh, P of A, X plus B, Y, uh, C, X plus D, Y. So let's say if A minus is equal to that, then this might well be that, okay? Something like that. So for instance, the matrix, what is, uh, how does the metric, the metric, the, so if I take lambda, uh, one of a lambda, so it now represents in the basis, so in the basis, natural basis, which is xn, xy, n minus one, x, uh, two, one, n minus two, it represents as lambda n uh, lambda n on here I have uh, lambda n minus two and here I have lambda minus n. Right? So that's irreducible representation. So this representation, irreducible representation, give rise to a to a map. So then there exists a map xi that goes from RPN, RP1 to RPN, which is a uh, uh, row zero equivariant. So that's going to be row zero, row zero. And uh, up to lots of typos, in homogeneous coordinate, you have one T is going to give rise to one T, T square, T cube, Tn, and this is called the uh, Veronese embedding. Right. So now let's explain that. So now the goal is to explain that. So let so the, we have the following proposition. Let rho, so let's, let's start with the definition. A function representation of gamma in SLNR is a representation rho, which can be written as a uh, <coughs> rho zero composed with lambda, and here this is a function representation in SL2. So now I want to explain that this, this representation is an Ozov on the final splitting. So why is it so? <clears throat> it's going to be a splitting 
of E row, which is going to be a full flag splitting. So you have E one row plus E N row, right? So, so remember that if I have U in H2, this defines a splitting of R2 as a, as a psi of U plus psi star of U. So what does a splitting does? A splitting define a, so in particular, you have a specific choice, choice A, uh, you have a subgroup A include, included in SL of R2, SL2 of R, of uh, diagonal matrix with respect to the splitting. Right? That, and when I have a splitting, I can say what are the matrices which are, which are uh, diagonals to splitting, it's just this matrix that preserves that guy and that guy. Okay? So then this define. Using that, a splitting in Rn <laughs> using star, right? So a splitting in R2, if I have this irreducible representation, a splitting in R2, define a splitting in Rn, okay? So here you have a map. So what do you have now? Thanks to the existence of the irreducible representation, so because of the existence of the irreducible representation, you obtain a map U of H2 to the space of full splitting of E, which is Rn. Okay, because, and this goes by defining first a splitting in R2, then a splitting here, right? So, in other words, so this is actually, and this is, of course, this is SL2R equivalent. Because it's just, because I didn't make any choice. So then, what happens? So it follows that E rho itself over U of gamma now splits as a full splitting E1 plus, plus En. Okay? So now exercise for you. Show that the splitting is, is a dominating. So I'm going to give rise to a I'm going to explain the ID. So what did I explain before? I explained before that a point U, if I have U in H2, so this defines a splitting of R2 
But actually, this defines more than that. This actually defines a base. Right? This defines a base in R2, which is this V on W. So the splitting is invariant under the group, under the geodesic flow, but the base itself is not invariant. Okay? And it's exactly transformed by so transforming along phi t by e to the t, e to the minus t. What I've just explained before is that the base in R2 now define a base in Rn. <laughs> it's just what I explained before in this, with, with this construction. And then they trans it's going to transform along phi t. Now, not by this matrix, but of course by this matrix, which is et, e to the uh, nt, n minus 2t, what happens? e to the a minus nt, right? I'm pretty sure everything is incorrect here. But essentially the idea is that you have this diagonal matrix. And the, 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 the real important fact here is that the eigenvalues are strictly ordered. And then you have your splitting. Okay? So, so let's take the theorem, which is too difficult to explain here. So what is a, now what, let's define what is a Hitchin representation. Hitchin representation, a Hitchin representation is a representation which can be deformed into a functional representation. So you have a, you have a, when you have a representation, you can talk about families, continuous family of, of a representation by just deforming the generators. Okay, so that's a Hitchin representation. And why they're called Hitchin? Because there's beautiful theorem by Hitchin. In 92, which said that it says way more than that, the space of each representation, the deformation space of each representation, I mean, and the space of, uh, of homomorphism up to conjugacy, is a ball. So next week, I'm going to try to explain where does the third theorem come from. So, so now the theorem, which pays my salary this day, is the following. The space of each in representation, every each in representation, each in representation, is and those off. So the point is that so you start with a function representation. You start deforming it a little bit. Structural stability tells you that it's going to be a Hitchin representation. It's going to be an Ozov. The hard part is to prove that it's a global thing. It's not just local deformation, it's just global deformations. But that's something specific which is due related to the fact that uh, well, let's not go there.
So now I want to talk about limit maps. So let's start with example. Uh, before, um, so for uh, functional representation, so in SL2 now, so let's say two functional representations. So then you have this limit map, Xi, which play a role, which is a map from the boundary at infinity of gamma to RP1. And this is just a classical identification. So here for any chain representation, you also have a limit map, which is actually a ghost, ghost, you say ghost or ghost, ghost of the actual A, you know, scary ghosts. Kitchen representation, then you have a limit map. So it's, there is a more complicated limit map, but let's just say something into RPN. So what is this one? So you take the limit, usual limit map into RP1, and this is a Veronese embedding. So if you think about it, this exactly corresponds to the highest eigenvalue of your object here. Okay? So I want to, to explain that this is a general fact. So the theorem, a proposition, let's say. So you can find a proposition. This is way cl more clarified in the, in the paper by Guichard and Vinart, which is that, um, okay, so, no. <coughs> so, so we have this splitting, right? So by definition, so anyway, this would be limit maps, right? A definition of splitting, so, uh, so you have this map, so you have a splitting, which is a split is a splitting over u of gamma of e. It splits, so let's say this is a, this is a point in u of gamma, and this split, uh, let's say I have a splitting into two objects, right? Okay. I'll just consider the case of a splitting into two objects to make the life simpler. So you have this splitting. So it's is zero. So you can lift the situation here to E over L, which is U, this is U of gamma, and this is L divided by gamma, and this is zero. And now you have a splitting. So the splitting gives rise to a splitting give rise to a map psi which is from uh, let's say uh, rank of psi is equal to, to one right this is it's just to avoid complication it doesn't make sense so what is this map it's a map from l to the space of splitting. So the space of splitting is uh, P of E. Actually, it's, it's, it's contained in the space of P of E cos P of E star. And this map is to a point U. I have uh, Xi of U and Xi star of U. Right? So now, because say, we know that the splitting is invariant by phi, so, uh, since the splitting is invariant by phi, It follows that, of course, the splitting boils down to a map from the boundary at infinity of gamma square to P 
of E cross P of E star. I'm sorry, I, I identify the space of hyperplanes with the projected space of the door. And now the proposition. which is the following, that this splitting actually is better than that. So um, there exists, and this is holder. <laughs> there exists map Xi and Xi star, which goes from the boundary at infinity of gamma to P of V e and P of V e star, respectively, so that so you have this uh, antipodal condition, so that first uh, xi of x plus xi star of y uh, is transverse to xi star of y if x is different from y. Okay, so that's... And secondly, xi of the point xy is actually xi of x Xi star of y. Okay, so this splitting actually only depends on the endpoints of the geodesics. And that's exactly, this object are exactly the limit maps. So these are the limit maps of the representation. And of course, if you know the limit maps, you know the splitting. And if you have these properties, this uniform contraction that uh, Misha was describing before, then this exactly amounts to say that this splitting is actually a dominating splitting. <clears throat> so how does the proof go? I'm going to explain it a little bit. So essentially, what you want to prove is that Well, again, I may have screw up between x and y. But this is a good exercise for you to figure out what is correct. So to you, what happens? So, so that's say u of h2. Just think, just think of a surface group to make your life simpler. It's going to work in, in general, but it's easier. So, so now I have two imagine I have two geodesic here, and so that's going to be so two geodesic here, and they have the same point at infinity, right? So I have u and I have v. So what do I want to prove? So I want to prove, so my goal is to prove that psi of u is actually equal to psi of v. Uh, and that would be, um, um, So there is a bad choice of notation here. So just for the purpose of the proof, let's call that xi infinity, xi infinity, xi infinity, xi infinity, xi infinity. Okay? And that, that would be by definition equal to xi infinity of x. So if you prove that, you're done. So uh, what what do you do? So I think it's a... Uh, so actually, I think, yeah, here you see, I think it's Xi star, Xi star, and Xi star. So what happens? So you take this, uh, so you have this uh, little thing here, and you have this little thing here. So now you go, you go very, very far, 
okay, along the flow. So then, uh, so going forward, and Xi star of phi t of u on Xi star of phi t of v are going to be closed. Um, this is because this distance is small, and this is a continuous map. You have to use the fact that it's a continuous map. So they are very close in the future. Okay? I want to claim that they are even closer in the past. Right? Because what do I do? So let's, let's, try, to, uh, let's try to make the picture here. So that's going to be, so that's an important picture, so I, I'm going to make, to make it bigger. Okay. So I have Xi of u here. So now at some point I'm kind of close. So I have Xi of u again. And here I have Xi of v. So what do I do? I parallel transport, which is somewhere here. I parallel transport this guy along, let's say, a neural sphere. And I have this guy. I can identify this object with something which I want to call Xi hat of V, which is just I parallel transport this guy to this guy. And this is just saying it as a constant object. So now I move in the past. Because this is contacting in the past, it follows that this guy now, so if I take phi minus t of xi star of v, this is going to be very close, even closer to, to xi of u. So then, xi phi minus t of this xi hat star of phi t of v, and again, what is this object? This is a parallel transport along an orosphere is, let's say, epsilon close is e to the minus t epsilon close. So because of the contraction property, right? So but what is this object now? It's the same thing as the parallel transport along this line here. Right? But this is a parallel transport. So this object, phi minus phi minus t, this object is a parallel transport of psi of v along an orosphere, right? But this is, this is an independent on t, right? So letting t goes to infinity, this guy is going to converge to this one. So this means that the parallel transport of this one along this yellow line is actually xi minus of you, right? So um, the conclusion is that conclusion is that conclusion electric goes to infinity, the parallel transport. Transport of phi of xi of v along an orosphere is xi of u. So that should be xi star. So, in other words, parallel transport is something that has been constant. Xi star of v 
is actually equal to xi star log. Okay, so you move forward, you're very close, and then you move backward. So you could totally explode the situation, but not in the situation where when you go forward, you are going to contract to something. Okay, so this only works for one of the guys, but not for the other. Okay, so that's the proof. So this, uh, as uh, Misha explains, this uh, limit map carries a lot of information. And so, and for instance, in the case of projective and other uh, representation, you have this nice uh, uh, theorem by uh, Gishar and Linhart. Uh, Gishar and Linhart. So, so let gamma be an irreducible representation in SLE. Assume rho, rho O representation of gamma in SLE. Assume that there exist continuous maps psi from the boundary at infinity of gamma to P of E. Assume that you have psi star goes from boundary at infinity to P of E star. Then, so that if x is different from y, psi of x plus is transverse to psi star of y, then rho is anosov, is projective anosov. So that's kind of super weak anosov. We're forgetting about the uh, scary thing, which is this dominating condition. Okay. And actually, there is a, if you want to see a baby case of that, there is a lemma like that in the Hitchin paper about Hitchin representations. Okay. I have 11 minutes. So I'm going to summarize a 100 page paper in 11 minutes. So now I want to claim that. I want to explain that these objects are really dynamical systems. So, so if gamma is an element of gamma, then this defines gamma plus and gamma minus uh, fixed points in the boundary at infinity of gamma. And then this defines a periodic orbit this defines L of gamma plus, gamma minus, which is inside L, which is an orbit, natural orbit of the flow phi t, which is invariant by little gamma. And of course, gamma is different from the <coughs> identity. <coughs> and so this defines a closed orbit. in U of gamma. So now let's plug in, uh, let's plug, let's plug in rho a projective and other representation to make the life easier. So can you obtain the monodromy? Okay, so phi uh, closed orbit of gamma. So let's say with period um, L of gamma. Okay, so then phi of L of gamma, right? So I move along my flow. I know that I come back, but of course in the fibers, I'm not going to come back. 
So this defines the map phi of L of gamma, which is actually an endomorphism of the fiber of E point, okay, which belongs to this closed orbit. And this projective another of representation, of course, is conjugated to rho of gamma. So the representation, the individual representation of an element gamma, they're not for, for, forbidden in that story, they just appears as individual monodromy of each orbit. So as I said before, the fact that you are projective and also of implies that phi of gamma as a, what has a projective and other tells you that uh, phi of gamma as a, a uh, unique eigenspace E1, okay, phi of C of gamma, L of gamma, as a unique eigenspace E1, okay, with eigenvalue lambda 1 of gamma, of rho of lambda, so I'm going to, to uh, lambda rho of gamma, so that's a notation, so that lambda rho of gamma is a spectral radius of uh, phi of gamma, so it's going to be equal to the uh, uh, spectral radius, maximal eigenvalue of phi of gamma. And I want to call that the length. So the definition now, I said that lambda rho of gamma is the length, I'm sorry, log, 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 log. Log for that, let's say I've made, put some absolute value to make the life easier, is the, is the length, that's the definition of gamma with respect to Okay, so I have this uh, spectral data, so to say, as this uh, spectrum of a representation. We have a spectrum of rho, which is a map which associated to gamma, to a contradictory class of gamma. This collection, which I want to call, so let's define this lambda rho of gamma, right? Lambda rho of gamma. So this is a map from the space of conjugacy class of gamma. These conjugacy classes into R. So now you want to, would like to know stuff about that. So here's uh, a um, some uh, sample results of joint work with. Uh, <laughs> um, um, Bridgman and Harry uh, Sambarino. So the first one is spectral rigidity. What a spectral rigidity means that if, so I want to call this map lambda rho, right? So if lambda rho is equal to lambda rho 1 is equal to rho 2, then this is fly that rho 1 is conjugated to rho 2. I should emphasize here that um, that could be a representation in dif different dimensions. I don't care about the dimension, right? Second thing is that there exists, so that's a technical thing, which, but it's very important in, in the proof, that exists a unique 
Jet is the flow for gamma. For gamma. Um, Yeah, yeah, let's assume row, row one, row two are irreducible, right? Yeah, you're, I'm sorry. Forgot that. So there exists a unique geodesic flow for gamma whose periods are exactly uh, the are exactly lambda row. So that's an important object, and that's the object you want to call the geodic flow of the representation. And in, in particular, as a corollary, you obtain that uh, lambda rho of gamma is coarsely equivalent, or at least coarsely equivalent. There is no sign for that. Coarsely, meaning that, uh, okay, it's less than k time L of gamma, 1 over k times L of gamma, and here this is the translational length. Yes, it's by ships equivalent to the code. Yeah. So that's a consequence of that. No, no, it's just happy, but I, I, uh, uh, yeah. So, so actually, there is something which is technical here, which I I don't know if it is a restriction on a hyperbolic group or not, which is that this geodesic flow, it's, it implies that the group of geodesic flow is metric anosov. So, so that you have better than the contraction of that, you really have foliation by guys on which you have ex explicit uniform exponential contraction. So I don't know if this is a restriction on, 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 uh, on, geodesic, on, on geometry groups or not. That's uh, also something which is here, but it's too technical to talk about. So, uh, finally, we may now define the entropy of a representation, which is the... Uh, right, so, um, so given A, let um, uh, L of A, so this is a real number, which is a set of those conjugacy class whose length is less than A. Okay, I just consider those guy. So, so then this set is finite, but that's not worth, uh, well, let's say, on N of A, which is the cardinal of L of A, and so this object is actually finite, it's not very hard to, to get from that. So, but then the entropy of rho, which is going to be the limit when A goes to infinity of, of what? Of the logarithm of N of A, one of A. Okay, so this object is well defined. So this is well defined. And depends analytically on the representation. If you have an analytic family of representations, then this function is analytic. So, uh, so it hasn't rang yet, so I still have five minutes. So let's introduce another object. So you can introduce the intersection of two representations. So actually it's a very, uh, so, so let I of row one, row two, no, 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 it's just, uh, it should be called rather the pressure intersection than the pressure intersection. So we made a confusing definition by calling it intersection. And that's my, on my, in my garden, I think. And this is going to be 
the limit when a goes to infinity of 1 over n rho 1 of a. So of course, this object should depend on rho on rho, right? Of, I want to compare on the average the length of this object. So it's going to be, I'm sorry, for the sum for gamma in L rho 1 of A of lambda rho 2 of A divided by lambda rho 1 of A. Okay? So again, I is C analytic. And now you have a, another object. So in some sense, the flow, uh, there is a nicer flow, which is you, you, you reparameterize by a constant so that the entropy is one. So um, I'm sorry. Um, So this is going to be G, let's J of row one, row two. I'm just going to renormalize. It's going to be E row one divided by E row two. No, E row two divided by E row one. I of row one, row two. So this has nice property. And for instance, it says that J of row one on row two is greater than equal to 1 with equality if on in leaf rho 1 is equal to rho 2. Okay. So say something puzzling. What? It's, the definition is asymmetric. The definition is asymmetric. This intersection is not symmetric in rho 1 and rho 2. OK? And uh, finally, so because you have a function which is greater than 1, you can take the Hessian. So let g rho 1, which is a Hessian of the function rho give rise to i rho 1 rho, j, I'm sorry, at rho 1. So I consider this function as a function of just the second variables, and I consider it Hessian at rho. So this defines A is positive definite, so that's a new part. So for instance, on, let's say, Hitchin representations, And it actually coincide with Val Peterson on the function locus. That's a result that is essentially due to Volpert. And finally, on the space, space of Zariski dense, another representation for any group. Gamma. So that's a so-called pressure metric. So I think I should stop. And uh, next week, uh, if you are still around, I will try to explain the construction of a Hitchin representation from the point of view of complex analysis, because this is one really of the most fascinating Subject here that for surface group, you have these purely dynamical objects, spectrums, geodesic flow. And on the other hand, you have the complex objects, Higgs bundle and stuff. And there is some relation of that. But lots of that is very mysterious yet. And for instance, let's say the, the most beautiful relation between geodesic flows and Complex analysis in the context of surface group is the trace formula, and maybe there is something like a trace formula for this object or surface groups. And uh, I should I should stop.
Right, this is defined for, this is the, so anytime you have a fam, analytic family of a representation, of an of representation, projective an of representation. So you have this two tensor, which is defined. To have positive, definite, positive, to have positive. The hard part is to prove it's positive. I'm sorry, uh, no, no, sorry, 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 no, no, the hard part is to prove it's definite, I'm sorry. Positive is come from the fact it's a, it's a minimum. The hard part is to prove it's definite, right? I'm sorry, definite. Tons of them. <laughs> no, actually, uh, well, I should, I should stop, so you're free to go. <laughs> No, uh, is it maybe, uh, yeah. So there is this, uh, so uh, representation SS3, there is two components, right? A hitching component and there is the other. And this other contains another representation, but just in a small set. And there's lots of interesting questions about this other component. Right, but I don't care about the, the third one. <laughs>